Well, this is an auspicious celebration in any case because many, many years ago, at the beginning of, near the beginning of Works in Process, we did string trio number one here, and it was uh, choreographed by Jean-Pierre Bonfou, I believe. That's right. And so it was performed. I think, did we do it in the pit? For some reason, I remember being in the pit when we did that. It could be. Being in the pit here is like a little bit like uh, traveling on the subway. Uh, although there's more room on the subway, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the first trio was, the first time I ever heard it was, well, Charles and I have been working together, and so we've now been working together for 52 years. Some such thing, yes. Quite a long time. And Seems a little... Yeah. So he said, oh, I'd like you to hear my new string trio. It's played by the Potomac Trio, and there are a few problems with it. Some of the, the fast music was too slow, and the slow music was too fast, and different things like that. But I listened to it, and I thought, well, this is a magnificent piece of music, and so I'm going to get a group together. We're going to start playing it, and that's, that's who played it here. But there were different other groups that played it as well. So, And it's good to introduce Charles, because there are very few people who, who could be called music's master at any given time on planet Earth, and one of them is sitting to my left, so that's good. And now comes the question that we've all been waiting for. We know about Charles, we've read about him, heard his music, but what happened before that time? Do we need to know about your past, about your parents, about how you grew up and where you went to school? things like that? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> one time many years ago, uh, when there was still WQXR would occasionally, it was a radio station, does it exist anymore? Yes, uh, it, it does. It, it used to have, uh, actually it had a resident string quartet among other oddities, all these long gone, in any case, uh, I was uh, given a two minute interview by somebody, and the interview, uh, when I was a very young composer, the interview went something like this. Well, Charles, I think you have a, uh, some kind of a background in medicine. I said, no. <laughs> uh, actually, well, surely your, your parents must uh, uh, be involved in medicine in some way. And I said, no, actually not. My father's a history professor. And uh, the, the interviewer kept on insisting, saying, are you really sure there's nothing to do with medicine? Uh, you, yourself, you're not interested in a particular? I said, well, I have, it's a fine thing, but I have actually nothing to do with it. Ah, oh, time to finish the interview. That's all that happened. And, but just to make, keep the record clear, I'm not involved in medicine. And neither were my parents. My father was a professor at Columbia. My mother had been a biochemist back in the days when there weren't so many women who did such things in the 30s, 1930s, uh, gave up her career to uh, inflict motherhood on her two children, of whom I was one. And, but didn't you, in fact, leave home at a fairly young age and well, move to 57th few, Street? We and, had a few disagreements about various matters, uh, which led to my departure, but eventually everything got smoothed out some years later. Oh, I see. I As such things drop, usually do. I'm going to drop this subject right now. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what about, um, since you've had a long and illustrious career and written so much music, what's a piece that stands out in your mind for one reason or another? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm always concentrated on what I'm doing at the moment, so I don't really uh, have favorites. Okay. And I'm always uh, concerned with whether or not I have done a proper job in a given piece, and as I say, what I work on at the moment is, the, is my preoccupations. I don't, I don't really have favorites. Well, I know you just finished a ballet for the Los Angeles Ballet, but what's on your composing desk right now? I'm writing, I, I had, uh, sometime in the 70s, I wrote a percussion symphony for 24 people, uh, and that's been around for a while, and I decided I'll have another one. Uh, this time, only for 12, but it'll make a lot of noise anyway, so it's a second <laughs> percussion symphony, and that's what I'm working on. And is it a vast setup? Because the percussion now is the, the, the instrument no. that's really still evolving. No, not really. I mean, you, you mean a vast kitchen full of instruments? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't really I don't believe in that. There are certain percussion instruments that I thoroughly dislike. For example, the, these little dangly bell tree things that you can't control. You know, oh, hit yeah. them once and they, they clatter away until they decide to stop. Uh, and you can't, uh, you can't really do anything except wait for the thing to be over. Uh, <laughs> like so much music that we hear, after all. Uh, so why would I put that in my piece? 
Well, you've so also... It's much more restrictive. Yeah. Mallet instruments, a couple of pianos, uh, tam-tams, cymbals, uh, gong, uh, other kinds of gongs, drums, of course. Yes. That's sort of rather routine stuff. So how about wooden things? You didn't mention any well, wooden Well, mar marimba. Okay. One of my regrets is there aren't more commonly available good wooden instruments. You know, marimba, xylophone, and, and there are some log drums and things of that sort, but uh, they're not really satisfactory and they're very hard to get, so it's oh. very impractical to use them. Well, I, I have seen your percussion quartet performed, and I believe there were break drums. The, the, the four players were set up far apart from each other, so you could hear the break drums moving around the stage. Yeah, it was that's quite a very a penetrating sound. It rings, uh, and it's much more controllable than, say, a cymbal, which makes a, a kind of big wash of sound, uh, unless you damp the end of it when you hit it. So uh, those are good, but not for pitch. I also have Omglocken, which are oh, yeah. essentially cowbells, but they're actually tuned. Uh, sometimes a little out of tune, and and what are called nipple gongs for the reason that they have a nipple, and uh, they are also pitched, so I use them as well. Yes, and uh, the brake drums, in order to get a brake drum, you must go to a uh, place where they destroy cars, and then you can procure brake drums there. Um, <laughs> this, that was I just I thing haven't done it's, this, it's a real came from a real car. I haven't, I, well, yes. I have not gone to chop shops, but I suppose some people do. <laughs> I never have. Um, so we're going to hear the first string trio now. And is there any way in which you'd like to introduce the action in some way? Uh, what do you mean? Well, it starts slow, and then it gets faster and faster, and that's then it gets right. slower it's, again. That's right. It's, well, at the end, it slows up a bit. Uh, but that's, uh, that's about it. It, it. The rate of activity increases. And um, from one moment, to one moment to the next, there's just gorgeous harmony, which you will hear. And, um, and expressive melodies, and what more can you ask? Yes, well, I don't want to uh, spoil anything, but and it's not good to ask an audience to listen for something, but there's an opening bit which centers around the violin, and then at the end, it's the same kind of thing, but slowed down four times. And so it has a kind of a, dare I say, cosmic effect. Well, it's cosmic, but also, it, uh, one should remember, it's 50 years old now. And it, as, it, as it happens, it was one of the first uh, uh, works of mine that was used by what was then very young uh, works in process, although not, it had already been written, it had been played a number of times, uh, on this stage choreographed by Jean-Pierre Bonfou. Uh, so there's a little old and kind of sentimental connection with works in process, and it's very meaningful to me that it should be done here again in, in uh, uh, co uh, conjunction with the new one, which uses the same little snippet of material, but you wouldn't be able to tell it. Uh, it's transposed, it's messed around with in various ways to keep its identity hidden. <laughs> uh, but the two pieces are, in some fundamental way, related. It's kind of like Superman and Clark Kent, or something. I don't think not, that's no, not quite. exactly. <laughs> Superman and Batman, are they, <laughs> do they still exist? I, I think so. Well, anyway, if there's nothing more to say, we should hear some music, because that's idea. what we came for. Thanks, Charles. Thank you.
Peter Stoss is joining us. Charles, I think it's still kind of cosmic at the end. Well, it was beautifully played, I have to say. Yes, bravo. Thank you very much for that. So, in, in the lore of string players, is not the string trio the hardest combination of all? Because it's not like a string quartet where you could hide there's nowhere to hide. Exactly. I, I think um, I, I was, when you say this, I think about one article in the Strat, you know, this, that's our magazine uh, yes. for strings. And they had a, an, a terrible, terrible article about uh, string trios, and they call it the Cinderella of string genres. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a bit of, um, yeah, it's, I th for me, when I read this kind of titles, it's a bit of both sides. I think uh, most of the times, uh, people think a string trio is a quartet minus one, but yes. I think as a composer, I can Charles can. It's a duo plus two. <laughs> <laughs> can confirm like writing for three voices is completely different than writing for four voices. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. I think it, it's Charles. Is it not true that if one writes for three voices, you can spin it out into four, and then that's why I said it a lot of places to hide. Well, it depends on how you define the notion of voice. I don't mean in a vocal sense, but line. Mm. Exactly. Uh, yes. If one thinks of it in the old-fashioned way, then there are three people who play three different lines, some, mostly simultaneously, sometimes in different combinations. But uh, it is possible for one voice to combine the attributes of two uh, or more. Oh, yeah. yes. So I don't find uh, the, the fact that there are three people playing here instead of four or more in any way limiting, and certainly with a wonderful performance like this, uh, you wouldn't want any more. Well, the colors that come out, and you got all the colors, the harmonics, the pizzicato, the tremolos, and all the yeah. things, that ponticello, that make it all sound different, that one feels it's, it's a vast tapestry, actually, mm -hmm. this thing, so. I, I think it's a big challenge, um, maybe because I, I, I admire your, your, uh, your recording of the string trio, but I, I, I think uh, when you play a string trio, uh, like you say, there is no way to hide, so you have to be um, like, I think when you sing poly polyphony, like make every line very uh, aware and very conscious of how you shape it and how you stand to the, another uh, line or voice or... Uh, yes. And I, th I think with a string quartet there are more, um, or even more uh, voices, there are better ways to hide, of course. Yes. It's, uh, well, people yeah. don't know this, but actually you're quite yeah. an active singer of early music. Yeah, as And well. so you have to do that, and you're, I think you're on the bottom, if I'm yeah, not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, the cellist role of being on the bottom is kind of fun because you have, it's like you're juggling these upper two voices. Oh my God. I think yeah. I'm gonna put this note a little early, see what happens, uh -huh, and uh -huh, put exactly. that one a little later. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Quite, quite an enjoyable yeah. thing. 
But Charles, so you had the string trio, and then the trio asked you to play the, write the new piece. What That's happened right. upstairs? Um, <laughs> I sent a message. And I said, nobody home. <laughs> so, uh, I wanted to, after all these years, there was, as I said, 50 years difference between these two pieces, the one you heard and the one you were about to hear. Uh, I thought it not to, not to make any direct connection, except, as I said earlier, that I took a little snippet of basic material from the original one, changed it slightly by transposition, uh, and it becomes the basis of the new one. However, uh, that's where the similarity or the relationship ends, aside from the fact that it came from the same, uh, the same composer, but 50 years older, sadder and wiser. Uh -huh. okay. and then Actually, I, I was sadder oh. then than I am now, I have to be honest about it. You're sadder then? Uh, I think so. I remember those days. It was a different time in the world, of course. It was. We're getting back to it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in your trio, when you design programs, do you play the Mozart and the Beethoven and the Dochnani and the Webern and the Schoenberg before? To be honest, we, we don't play any like Beethoven that's just for our living room. So we oh, yeah. we yeah we we I, I, we refused even like a nice concert where we had to play Beethoven in between other pieces, which I don't think they fit well together. So I think um, when when you when you watch the repertoire of string trios, the the twentieth century that's that's where it happens. I think it's be yes. because of tonality explodes there or implodes, as you, it, no matter how you watch it, do it. It gives you um, a complete different uh, view to, um, uh, I think, voicing, um, especially with uh, like Weber and like Schoenberg. I was going to say uh, the Weber yeah. in particular is the one that reminds you of Charles. Yeah, Jones, yeah, yeah. Because the, you, your pitches are all over the place yeah, and yeah. things, th there are yeah. lines that are created yeah. from the different instruments crossing each other. I think like the Webern, that's absolutely a masterpiece. I think like Schoenberg uh, trio is an absolute masterpiece and I think it fits well to, when, when, when we play this, this first string trio, I think it fits exactly with the, the energy and also the, 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 the structure uh, with the Schoenberg trio. Uh, that, that's my, my, my yes. idea. Yeah. And so, Charles, you get the, a chance to hear the group before they play this performance. And yes. oh, by the way, I, I've already heard the piece. Charles sent, uh, sent me a recording of what from their performance that you had before. So, so wasn't there something before that I heard? Well, why did I? I had the score. Maybe I thought I heard it because I saw the score. Yeah. But was there nothing played ever in the new piece? The new piece. Well, there's there's a the G <clears throat> the G naturals repeated oh, yeah. that are at the end. I have that for you know three seconds in the new piece, which I carefully marked as a reference to the old one, just for sentimental reasons, no, no other. I think I would have created for myself a sound of the trio by looking at that score, because I did practice it a little bit myself, of course, to get out of and, and oh, that's similar. It's something's good. It, it, when, when you play, I, it feels like, like I, I know this motives or this small uh, uh, lines, or it feels very familiar. I but think. the texture is totally different, Charles. Was that an important different. thing yeah. for you to think about when you did it, or you didn't care? Uh, think about what? The texture. That it's the texture of the, of the three instruments is quite different in the new trio. Yes, I didn't uh, actually didn't. I wasn't in, engaged in a kind of uh, attempt to be different from the old piece. I see. I mean, since I've changed, obviously, as one does over so many years, uh, that's enough. I think. Well, I think. I mean, among other people myself wonders how much of your earlier music do you remember or, or reference when you write a new piece? Well, certainly none of it when I'm writing a new piece. The problem okay. that anybody, who, I suppose, any author, composer, anyone who does these things, who is producing something from within rather than looking at something from uh, outside the way perhaps a scientist might, uh, is that uh, we have habits and most of them I suppose we're not even aware of. Yes. Uh, and to worry about that is fruitless because you cannot, at least you shouldn't try to not be yourself. Yes. And uh, if you do, it usually en ends up rather badly. Well, and, and is it distillation of thought or distillation of, of ideas? I suppose so, but just, just by accident, I, not by accident, but, but uh, automatically in the sense that certain things that seemed necessary to do 50 years ago no longer seem necessary. Oh, yeah. And certain things that that might have, might have wanted to do 50 years ago, although I don't remember, are now perhaps possible. 
Okay, so you got the score in the mail, yeah. and, and how long did it take before you could play through? I, it took a while before the score arrived at my home because they, the, you know, customs in the Brussels airport keep it for some weeks, uh, and you they thought it was know, yeah. kind of suspicious, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, package. So. It, it took me some mails with a oh, custom to, to declare it and to, to, to have it home. So. I thought maybe they'd be afraid there was a secret code. Yeah, maybe. Well, I don't <laughs> understand what those symbols mean. They, yeah. some... <laughs> and I just explained it was a piece of music we had to create today here in, uh, in the Guggenheim. And, uh, so that, and, and it happens, uh, so it, it came home. You, you, you know the first trio very well. You know some works of Charles yes. well. And, and then you go through, you you just watch first, of course, I think, uh, like like all, you, you, you read the notes yes. in, 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 in your head, and then you start practicing. And what is very um, um, confrontating in a way is that it's not as um, exact um, written, in a, I mean, like every note in the first trio has oh, yeah. Uh, an accent or a dot or uh, uh, some dynamic sign, so it's a bit like Weber and Schirmer, very, um, um, I would say... Uh, Directed. Yeah, directing you to in, in how, to, how to play the, the music. I think the second trio is not that uh, directing you um, in, in, um, in that way. Although I think when you see the bowings and the, and, and the gestures in, in the lines, Yes. There, you feel there is a clear idea how the music should be shaped. In a way, it's, I think it's um, uh, as hard as the first trio to, to, to oh, yeah. practice, uh -huh. but on a, on a different level. Like the first trio is technically like very challenging to get all things together, uh, to, to get all the colors out. I think the second trio is very challenging to, to make it really like one ball, you know, mm -hmm. not like three different voices, but like one ball with, with the same idea and, and have it going on uh, in, in the same story. Yeah? Yes. That, that's how, how I feel uh, the music. You know. Well, Charles, you have a deep association and love and knowledge of old music. I mean, pre-Baroque or early mm -hmm. music, 16th, 15th and 14th century music. And I think that I, I see it in your composition quite often that it, it could it, be. I it, wouldn't be it surprised. It gets in there somehow. <laughs> Lofts over the top. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I, I don't not not rhetorically, but perhaps at a somewhat deeper level, beha behaviorally, if you will. I just want to say something about uh, uh, a dot or an accent on every note. Uh, as, as Peter says, that there, that there was, and especially when one is young, I think a desire to to nail everything down, to control everything, to get it exactly the way you want it. But the reality is, I hate to use that phrase, I take it back. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, uh, that it uh, uh, is never possible to nail everything down and that no matter how many dots and doodads and things there are on the page, mm -hmm. uh, it's still a very general document, a very general set of instructions. And a lot of the time, if one overloads, as I began to think I was doing it in earlier years, overloads the, the individual note with uh, too many instructions about exactly how to play it, uh, one sends to, uh, tends to break up a sense of or a possibility of phrase. Uh, one is going for something that uh, may be fine this time, but one changes one's mind about next time, and it's better to leave it all yes. much more open. Uh, performing experience, of course, shows that as well. Uh, so th that, that is something. Western music is unique in the sense that we have a written record uh, of the, the music, of, which is called the score, and it exists independent of the sound of the thing. So it's not a recording, it's not an improvised tradition, some of which are in the world are very, very great, the Indian particularly. Uh, and, but it is a thing that makes no noise, and yet it is the standard of reference for a lot of sound to come out as different performances take place. But, as I say, the, the essential fact of it is that it is a very general document, no matter how it looks on the page. And I think to recognize that is to give a certain, put a certain greater trust in the performer mm -hmm. and expectation mm -hmm. than some people have done in the past. Uh, in any case, in, in my own instance, it's uh, simply a gradual realization that it's better to let certain things be determined in performance, as it were, rather than to try to get everything organized up tight ahead of time. Yes. Well, I'm 
somewhat familiar with your work, of course, and uh, I think there have been a number of times when you're, you're getting to the end of the piece and I, I sense some frustration. Uh, I'm still working on this damn thing and I guess I'm going to try tidy it up a little bit more. So I think at that ending part, you read through it a thousand times and try to see if there's something that you've left out or wanted to put well, al in. Well, along the way, yes. Uh, Small revisions probably at the end. Well, the process of revision is continuous, but once it's done, it's done. Yes, okay. And I generally the don't revisit. <laughs> okay. If I made a mistake, I'll fix it in the next piece. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should hear this new piece. It would be Absolutely. about time. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Thanks so much, Peter. Yeah. Thank Bravo. you. <laughs> so, awesome.
Thank you. Mm-hmm. 